Hello my dear subscribers, I'm pleased to welcome you to my YouTube channel dedicated to author stories. Enjoy listening. For whom we're trying so hard, we don't even understand ourselves, sighed Mrs. Eleanor when her husband hung up the phone after talking to someone about their son's upcoming wedding. She tried to speak calmly, knowing that she wouldn't really achieve her goal, but hoping to plant a seed of doubt in her husband's mind. To somehow sway him just a little to her side. For our son, Eleanor. For our only son, her husband replied cheerfully. Yes, all we can do is accept it and go with the flow, watching our only child ruin his life. She sighed hopelessly and left the room. Indeed, their only son, Edgar, had decided to get married. And it was a good decision, given that he was 26. It was just the choice of the bride that bothered his mother. Not in terms of appearance, heaven forbid. Mrs. Eleanor wasn't so shallow as to nitpick about the shape of her nose, for example. And the bride's appearance seemed fine. It's just that she wasn't the right match for Edgar, no matter how you looked at it. The girl was from some distant outskirts, practically a suburb. She lived in a dormitory, studied at a pedagogical institute. And her name, some strange name like Serafina. It seemed like girls weren't named that anymore, unless it was in honor of some grandmother. Mrs. Eleanor, being a philologist by education, was very sensitive to words. And here was this Serafina. She might be fit for marrying a chauffeur or a foreman at a construction site, but not for Edgar, for heaven's sake. Edgar, whom his father had made the manager of his bank several years ago and couldn't praise enough for his business acumen. He wasn't just a manager anymore, he was practically the owner of the bank. A smart, business-savvy young man who had received his education abroad. But in terms of daily life, he turned out to be less intelligent and insightful. Naive, gullible. He got carried away with this simple girl, ready to marry her already. He couldn't take his eyes off her, didn't know how to please her. He was convinced that she loved him too. Maybe that was true. How could she not fall for a guy like him? She probably hadn't even dreamed of someone like him, and when she becomes a member of the family, a legitimate wife, she'll show her true nature. It hurt Mrs. Eleanor that her husband was so indifferent to the upcoming event. How can you be like this? Our son is about to take the most important step in anyone's life, and it's clearly the wrong step. And his own father? Instead of talking to him about it, he just shrugs and says something like, what's the big deal? He's a grown man, perfectly independent. If he wants to marry, he'll marry. If he wants a divorce, he'll get one. Nothing special about it. And the bride, well, she's just a girl like any other. And she's even helping out somehow. She's making calls, arranging the rental of a hall, inviting people there. And instead of comforting her, Eleanor, she seems to reprimand her. Eleanor, stop it. Don't escalate the situation. The girl might have her faults, but they'll have to live with them, not us. As if they, the parents, will just stand aside and their married son won't be their relative anymore. But what can you do? The woman had to resign herself and take a waiting position. After all, the wedding isn't today or even tomorrow. Who knows how things might turn? Although judging by the happy face of their son, you can assume that the wedding will happen regardless. Even if both parents were firmly against it. And Edgar was truly in love and happy. He considered meeting Serafina his greatest stroke of luck, something that made his education and career advancements seem like mere trifles. Serafina loves him, and nothing else matters. His parents might not be thrilled, but that's understandable. Parents will never be satisfied with their children's choices. And sometimes they just can't come to terms with the fact that their son or daughter are adults and are starting their own lives. 
The main thing is that they're not creating any obstacles, that's already good. Once they get to know Serafina better, understand her, see how happily they live together, all the discontent will disappear. Serafina will become a beloved daughter-in-law, there's no doubt about that. Just as there's no doubt that she loves him too. And there's no materialism in their relationship, which worries his mother. Yes, he's willing to give her anything, but she never asks for anything. Moreover, she gives him the world. For Edgar, a rational and pragmatic person, finding the words to express his feelings was difficult. But Serafina understands him without words. And it's a shame that his mother isn't endowed with the same quality, understanding a person and seeing their feelings. But Serafina, she doesn't need to say anything. She sees and feels everything. Their relationship is even more than love. They've become like one person. How can you explain this to anyone, especially if you're not well-versed in romantic nonsense? So, he tried to express his feelings materially by giving her gifts. But he realized that Serafina wasn't an ordinary girl. She wasn't the type who would receive a ring and jump for joy while secretly calculating its value to brag to her friends that she got a more expensive gift. But what else could he give her? What could be original and at the same time pleasant and needed? Sometimes Edgar was stumped, pondering this question. So, when he saw an older man selling wooden boxes on the street one day, he immediately thought, perhaps this is exactly what's needed. The boxes were intricately carved and very beautiful, undeniably unique, in other words, exclusive. He didn't even have two identical ones. And there was no doubt that no one else would have such a thing. True, the material was simple, wood, but clearly not the simplest kind. First of all, it was natural, and secondly, it was handmade. In other words, it was made with soul and love. And that's precisely what was needed. If you were to place a necklace or a pendant inside such a box, it would be perfect. He approached, took a closer look. Apparently, the seller didn't value his work too highly. Buy it, don't hesitate. These boxes are really beautiful. And, as you can see, perfect for a gift. Especially for a loved one, a woman or a girl. You see, they lock with a little key, and the key is included. This means a woman can keep her little secrets in there. And there's a little secret inside the box too. Right here, on the back of the lid, there's some poem written. Who are you buying it for? For my fiancé, Edgar said. Excellent. Here's a very fitting four-line verse. I'm sure your girl will like it. The seller opened the lid and showed the calligraphic verse written on the back. Yes, great. This is exactly what I need, in my opinion. Do you make these boxes yourself? Of course, I do. Each one is unique. You can be sure you won't find anything like it anywhere else. And the poems? Did some poet write them or did you? No, I didn't write the poems. They were written by a lesser known poet who unfortunately passed away. The man's expression slightly darkened. But all of that didn't matter and Edgar bought the box, already anticipating how amazed Serafina would be by its beauty. Edgar was still living with his parents, planning to move into a separate apartment after the wedding. Starting a family life in a separate territory, no one would argue with that. Serafina was refusing to move into the groom's house before the wedding, although she spent a lot of time there, sometimes staying for several days, which no one objected to. Well, the parents' house was big, and nobody was getting in anyone's way. Actually, they could have continued living like that if it weren't for his mother. She was determined not to leave the young couple in peace, especially considering her less than positive attitude towards Serafina, although she tried to hide it. 
She also believed that they needed to live as a family and that there was no question of separation when living in the same big house. Every time Edgar was reminded of this and he didn't want his young wife to feel the same way. His mother was at home, which wasn't surprising since she never worked anywhere, so she often stayed there. For the same reason, she often meddled in the affairs of the household, which included her husband, Victor, and their son, Edgar. And today, as soon as she saw Edgar return, she slipped into his room without much ceremony and saw him admiring the box. Come on, what did you bring there? Did you buy it? It's interesting, of course, but what's it for? In my opinion, it's just ostentation, twisting Edgar's purchase in her hands, Mrs. Eleanor delivered her verdict. Edgar took the box from her. I don't know what meaning you attach to that word, but in reality, it's an original, exclusive handmade item. I bought it as a gift for Serafina. Do you think she'll like it? Well, quite. It's just a thing for a country girl. And if you also fill this little box with candies, she'll be thrilled. Mom, snobbishness doesn't suit you, Edgar said in annoyance and regretted starting this conversation at all. Did you want to tell me something? And if I just wanted to be close to you, is that a crime? Or is a mother not needed by you anymore? I need you very much, Mom. But I don't like to hear any jabs directed at my fiancé. I thought you had a rather friendly attitude towards Serafina. Please don't mention the box to her, it's a surprise. Of course, naturally, I'm friendly with everyone. I understand everyone, I don't impose my nonsense on anyone, and, moreover, I don't disclose other people's secrets. Relax, son, I'll go rest too. I'll be in my room if you need me. Edgar breathed a sigh of relief when his mother left, admired the box a little more, thought about what to put inside. In the meantime, he tidied up the table and went about his business while Mrs. Eleanor was lost in her thoughts. She wasn't planning on acting directly, head-on, trying to eliminate the unwanted bride-to-be that would be a surefire way to ruin her relationship with her son. But there were so many other options that could help open his eyes to his girl and in turn to open her eyes to her fiance maybe just maybe this silly little box could help that same evening taking advantage of the good weather she set up to have tea on the terrace which provided a beautiful view of the sunset the future bride wasn't home she likely stayed in her dormitory so edgar was free that evening for a while, he discussed the details of the upcoming wedding with his father, then went to his mother, just to sit with her and talk. I want you to be happy, Mrs. Eleanor said. I am happy, Mom, her son replied. Yes, I can see that your girl loves you. Edgar had long noticed that his mother avoided calling his fiance by her name, but he didn't ask about the reasons. But here's the thing. Her jealousy might lead to unpleasant consequences at some point, you know. Jealousy? What are you talking about, Mom? Serafina and I trust each other completely, and there's no reason for anything like that. You're looking at everything through the lens of your infatuation, while I, after all, am a grown woman and understand her much better. It's quite obvious. The poor girl feels uncertain, understands that she's not exactly your ideal match. Well, that's it, Mom. I can't listen to this anymore. You start off fine, and then you descend into baseless accusations again. Some jealousy buries. I'm sorry, Edgar, I didn't mean to say anything bad, I swear. I'm not even trying to warn you. I understand that you'll get married anyway, no matter what I say. It's just that she really seems a bit too suspicious. I've noticed that when you're not home, she goes through your things, even old notes or something. What does she need them for? You were planning to throw them away, and she's already looked through everything. 
What worried me the most was when Irene, your cousin, was here. She told me that your fiancé called her and tried to ask about your past relationships. Irene didn't tell her anything, of course, but it made her quite uncomfortable. Are you serious? Serafina was trying to ask about something. I didn't know that. It's not very cool, I agree, but maybe Irene just misunderstood. She's not known for being dense, and especially not when someone asks her about your brother's past relationships and whether he's still in touch with those girls. It's hard not to understand what's going on. This is just what I know. Jealousy is a terrible thing, agree with me on that. I'm not saying it will lead to murder, God forbid. But it can tarnish your reputation in front of other people. Besides, she herself arouses suspicion. A jealous person is jealous precisely because they don't rule out infidelity from any side, projecting their feelings onto others. Edgar tried to wrap up the conversation, though it's hard to say his mother's arrows missed their mark. Certain doubts had taken root in him. Could it be true that Serafina is jealous and trying to find out something? Quite strange suspicions. He liked his relationship with the girl because they were completely open. There were no secrets between them. He himself would tell her about his past romances, whereas Serafina would say she had never been with anyone. This seemed truthful and most likely was. However, how easy it turns out to instill suspicion in someone's soul. He believed his fiancée, but he also believed his mother. She genuinely wished him happiness and wouldn't just accuse Serafina of something without reason. And Mrs. Eleanor, realizing that the first stone had been cast, decided to keep acting in the same vein. The next day, Serafina came to Edgar's place early in the morning, as it was a day off. But he needed to leave for a while on company business. He left the girl at home, considering her already part of the family, practically a family member. Serafina decided not to waste time and bake something for her beloved's return. She loved cooking and was quite skilled at it. Cooking in the dormitory wasn't very convenient, nor was it necessary. So, with permission, she occasionally did this at Edgar's house, secretly hoping to impress her fiancé's parents with her culinary talents. She suspected that in their eyes, she wasn't seen as a desirable match for Edgar. And what else could she do to prove her readiness for married life? This time, Mrs. Eleanor was very affectionate and talkative. She went into the kitchen, sat at the table, and began to admire the girl's diligence and skill. You're doing great, Serafina. It's clear you enjoy cooking and you're good at it. I, on the other hand, wasn't good at anything when I got married. Well, and I'm not very good now either. So, Serafina, when are you and Edgar planning to visit someone? Well, we weren't planning to visit anyone. What do you mean? Yesterday, Edgar brought something, some little trinket or something like that. I asked if he prepared a gift for you. And he said, no, he's going to visit someone to congratulate them. From what he said, it sounded like it might be your friend. A little box like that isn't really a gift for a guy. He hid it in the desk in his room and didn't even show it to me. So, I'm asking you about it. No, we didn't have any plans to visit anyone. Who would we visit right now? The wedding is coming up soon. Maybe sometime in the future. Well, maybe so. I probably misunderstood something, sorry, Mrs. Eleanor said, as if slightly embarrassed. And Serafina pondered, they really hadn't planned to congratulate anyone. So who did he prepare a gift for? Why didn't he tell me anything? Quite strange. For some reason, she couldn't get the thought of that little box out of her head, whether it was a box or something else, definitely not meant for her. After finishing her tasks and making sure her mother-in-law had gone somewhere, leaving the house empty, Serafina entered Edgar's study. 
She felt a bit awkward about touching his belongings in his absence, but she didn't want to ask him directly. Mainly because she didn't want to implicate her mother-in-law. Maybe it really was some secret of Edgar's, and his mom accidentally revealed it. And he hadn't planned to tell her about a gift for someone else. Who knows who he might have bought some trinket for. But she really wanted to see it. Her mother-in-law had said he hid it in the desk. She approached, opened one drawer, then another. A wooden box. She wouldn't mind having one herself. She picked it up and tried to open it. But no, the box was locked. However, the lock was fairly simple, and Serafina, taking out her keyring, tried to open it with the key to her mailbox. It fit, and the lock, it seemed, was just decorative. Opening it was probably even possible with a nail file. She opened it. The box was completely empty, but on the back of the lid, there was a quatrain. She froze. The verses weren't just familiar. She had actually helped a classmate compose them. There certainly wasn't a romance between them, of course. They were just kids at the time, and they used to compose poetry together. Then one day, they decided to write something about love, and that's how this quatrain came about. She had forgotten about it since then. After finishing school, she hadn't seen that classmate again. And later, after graduation, she learned that the boy had died either in an accident or some other unfortunate incident. She didn't delve into it and didn't even attend the funeral. It was too frightening and sad for her. And suddenly, these verses. Who copied them onto the box? For what occasion? Lost in thought, she didn't notice Edgar entering the room. Ah, uh, I see. Spying, huh? Going through my things? That means mom was right after all, he said discontentedly. Where did you get this box? How did you get it? Serafina was now more interested in this than who the item was intended for. What do you mean, how? I bought it, of course. I didn't steal it from someone else's desk or make it myself. I got it from some guy near the market. He was set up along the waterfront, a lone craftsman, apparently. But first, answer my question, by what right are you searching through my stuff? I'm not searching, I just wanted to see this box. And then I read the verses and... Very touching. But why are you rummaging through my things then? Why did you want to see the box? And how did you know there was a box there? Or were you looking for something else? Edgar was growing increasingly irritated. He felt that his beloved was hiding something. And indeed, for no reason at all, she was digging through his desk. His work desk, by the way. And what if this was the work of competitors? The argument was escalating, and Mrs. Eleanor was smiling contentedly outside the door. I can't listen to these accusations anymore. Serafina cried out and rushed out of the room. Edgar thought she had gone to their bedroom or the kitchen. She would cry, and they would make up. It usually happened that way between his parents. However, the girl quickly grabbed her purse and left the house altogether. Good riddance, the would-be mother-in-law wished her in farewell. Edgar reached for his phone, wanting to call his beloved and ask her to come back. But his mother stopped him. Wait, Edgar, don't call right away. Let her cool down. You should also cool down and think. Think about whether you really need all of this. What is it, Mom? Serafina? Yes, I need her. She's upset. Look at her, she's upset. But aren't you at fault? Can't you see that? Can you really go through someone else's belongings? What did she need in there? And this is just the one time you caught her. How many times has she gone through everything, top to bottom, when no one's watching? I have no doubt she's done the same with our things. 
I've noticed things aren't where I put them. I even argued with your father once when I thought he took my things. But that's foolish. He never took anything. And I hope you haven't either. Our housekeeper, who's been with us for over 10 years, has never been caught doing anything like that. No. So, who then? Edgar put the phone down. In reality, what did he have to apologize for? Was he to blame for not liking it when someone snooped in his desk? And that's how it happened that shortly before the wedding, two loving people quarreled, understanding that someone had simply interfered. Naturally, Serafina didn't plan to call Edgar either. She didn't consider herself at fault and was waiting for an apology from him, but he didn't call. And the girl, feeling down, began to recollect all the details of the argument. She remembered the poem that was written on the lid of the box. It intrigued her. Who could have known and written these lines? Neither she nor the boy had planned to show their creations to anyone. But it turns out they hadn't remained unknown, and now someone was writing them on boxes. Serafina decided to find that man. Edgar mentioned he bought them somewhere downtown near the market by the waterfront. The coordinates weren't precise, of course, but she thought she'd give it a try. On one of her free days, hoping to divert her mind from sad thoughts, she set out on the search. Serafina was deeply affected by the falling out with her fiancé. She feared they had broken up for good. She even felt physically unwell, her head was spinning, and a sense of weakness overcame her. But attributing it to emotional distress, she still resolved to find that man. And very soon, she did spot him in front of a small stall displaying similar items. He didn't look old, more worn out, as if not entirely healthy. Serafina approached, greeted him, still unsure how she would explain her interest. The man actually asked her, Interested in these little boxes? Take one, you won't regret it. I'll give you a good deal. Yes, thanks, but I'm not exactly looking to buy. You see, I saw one like these before, and there was a quatrain on the back of the lid. That's what caught my interest. You see, I remember that poem and know who wrote it. Is that so? Well, that's my son's work from his childhood back in school. Did you know him? Yes, we were in the same class, used to compose poems together. Well, including those about love. I heard he passed away? Yes, he's no longer with us, just me left. His wife passed away a while ago too. And I've always enjoyed working with wood, so I decided to make a living this way since I'm already on disability, quite ill. It'd be one thing if it was just me, but my son adopted two little boys shortly before his death, twin boys. I have to provide for them, can't refuse. They're my grandsons now, how can I turn them away? So, I sell these boxes. I found these verses in his old notebook. Well, and I write about love, friendship, all sorts of lines. People like it, they buy them. It allows me to provide for the boys a bit, they're still so young. That's something. I had no idea about the children. How did your son die? So young. To be honest, it's a dark story. I don't even know the truth myself. We didn't investigate much, I wasn't up to it at the time. You can imagine, such a tragedy, and the little ones. Yes, it's a complicated story. And Serafina realized she couldn't just leave the father of her former friend like that. Especially two little boys who had been orphaned for the second time. They exchanged addresses, and she promised to visit him. I apologize for not attending the funeral. Were those his children? No, but I understood he knew their mother. He said she died in childbirth, and the children were left as orphans. My son couldn't abandon them. There's a heavy story there, too. 
This tale indeed distracted her from her heavy thoughts and her relationship with Edgar. Her own troubles seemed far less significant compared to what had befallen her classmate and his father. She kept her word, began visiting the man. She got acquainted with the two boys, who were just over a year old. The boys were thrilled that another adult, who cared about them, had entered their lives. Mostly, they had been living with their grandfather. And when Mr. Felix was away, a kind elderly neighbor watched over them. Serafina always brought gifts, played with the kids. She felt so sorry for them. After all, it was difficult for their grandfather and his helper to go outside and play with them. They often felt lonely without companionship. And once, while playing with the little ones, Serafina suddenly realized that she would soon become a mother herself. This explained her discomfort. And she decided that she should tell Edgar about it. Regardless of whether their wedding would take place and how their relationship would unfold, he needed to know that he had a child. Separation was also not easy for Edgar. He truly suffered and couldn't understand why Serafina wouldn't make the first move towards reconciliation. After all, she had invaded his belongings. His mother pretended to sympathize with him, but at the same time, she assured him that a woman shouldn't behave like that. Well, what kind of love is that if she latched onto something and ran away at the first fight? Clearly, she's not clear in her conscience before you, that's why she doesn't call and doesn't come. Who would stop her? So now, think whether she ever truly loved you if she can't even make a call. And Edgar, as usual, believed his mother. After all, why wouldn't Serafina at least call him? So he suffered for a few weeks and then decided that he should find out what was going on himself. What if something had happened to her? Or had she found someone else? In any case, he needed to know the truth, otherwise, it would just be unsightly. Everything was ready for the wedding, but what about her? She ran away and won't even let him know about herself. He didn't want to explain things over the phone, he decided to meet and talk in person. He waited for her outside the dormitory one evening as she returned from classes. Edgar stopped Serafina and told her that they needed to talk. They couldn't break up a week before the wedding. Aren't you planning to cancel it? Aren't you afraid that I'll steal something from you again? The girl asked mockingly. Stop it, Serafina. I never thought of anything like that. Well, I said some foolish things I can't even remember. I didn't say anything about stealing, but I thought it was an invasion of privacy when you went through my desk. I peeked because I overheard, I won't say from whom, that you bought something, obviously not as a gift for me. Well, yes. And that's why I got worried and did something foolish. But I didn't expect that kind of response from you either. Well, can't we forget about it? Let's try not to fight anymore. It's a trivial matter, after all. All right. Especially since thanks to that box, I found a person who clearly needs my help. And Serafina told the story of her deceased friend's father. He's going through a really hard time. He's sick. I suspect it's cancer, although he doesn't really know. He doesn't have time to see doctors, and there isn't much money either. I want to be involved in his life and the fate of those children myself, maybe even adopt them. I'm also going to have a child soon, our child together. This news greatly impressed Edgar. He was happy, and riding this wave, he was ready to agree to anything, even adopting an entire orphanage. He was also willing to participate in Mr. Felix's treatment. But, of course, they decided to postpone all of this for a while. Both the adoption and the treatment would be discussed after the wedding, which naturally had to take place. Holding hands tenderly, Serafina and Edgar returned home. Seeing this, Mrs. Eleanor understood that she had lost. Well, what? 
You've decided not to trust your mother and to trust her instead. She couldn't help but ask her son in a hushed tone. She's my future wife, Edgar replied, realizing the role his mother played in their fight. And I'm asking you, don't try to separate us anymore. You won't succeed. Just so you know, we'll have three children soon. Leaving his stunned mother with her mouth hanging open, he went to his room with his fiancée. The wedding took place, and it was as beautiful as the young couple had dreamed. After all, the preparations were serious. Both the groom and his father were actively involved. So, everything was done to the highest standards. Guests were amazed by the newlyweds, and only the most attentive ones noticed how the newly minted mother-in-law sometimes pouted in offense. Meanwhile, the groom and bride, sometimes distracted from the celebration, started discussing something intently. Though, such situations are probably not uncommon at any wedding. Mrs. Eleanor, however, tried to clarify the question about those very three children whom her son had promised her. This question greatly troubled her. Tell me, is she pregnant? Is she having triplets? Did you get an ultrasound? She whispered to her son whenever she managed to be alone with him for a minute. But Edgar only smiled mysteriously in response. He understood that everything would soon become clear, and his mother was unlikely to approve of his decision not only to marry a disapproved of girl, but also to adopt children of unknown origin. Yet, the decision with Serafina was firm. Shortly after the wedding, they began to consider becoming parents ahead of schedule by formalizing the adoption of the twins. However, when they turned to Mr. Felix and asked him about the status of the children under his care, Serafina was surprised to learn that they had never been in any orphanage. How could that be? Where did they come from then? Mr. Felix told them a shocking story that left the future parents in shock. His son worked as a driver for a wealthy man before his demise. The pay was good, and while the workload wasn't extensive, he practically lived in the house. After all, his services might be needed by the owner, his wife, or his son at any moment. There was a young woman there, like a maid or something similar that wealthy households have. He liked her, but they had nothing more than a friendship. Moreover, he knew that she had some warm relationship with the owner. Yet, it didn't remain without consequences. One day, my son saw her crying and learned that she was pregnant by the owner. She must have hidden it for a while, but when it became impossible to hide, she confessed to the owner. That's when it turned out that he not only refused to acknowledge the child, but also started threatening her. He simply kicked the girl out of the house. That's absurd. This sounds like a story from the distant past. Serafina exclaimed in horror. Perhaps, but my son's story happened in the prison. He told me that he fell in love with this Elena, sympathized deeply, promised to marry her and adopt the children. It was already known that she was carrying twins. If they had done that, things would have turned out differently. But this foolish girl wouldn't back down. She wanted the biological father to take responsibility for the children, at least financially. She told the owner's wife, and she said she would do a DNA test. Prove paternity and reveal to the world that he abandoned his children. Good heavens, did she really think that such a man would acknowledge them? Possibly. Naive girl. My son told her it was pointless. But instead of calmly waiting for the children to be born, she stirred up trouble, and it all ended up in a storm. I don't even know what that despicable rich man wanted. Well, the woman died during childbirth, so be it, I would have forgotten this story. But he decided to take the children, not to raise them, but... I don't know, don't ask me, thinking about it is terrifying. My son might have known something, or maybe that's why he died. He somehow managed to snatch the babies, brought them here, wanted to save them from danger. So, 
Are you saying that they've been living with you illegally, without proper registration? Edgar exclaimed in astonishment. Well, no. He managed to adopt them, put them under his name. But the real father knew about it. I don't know what he wanted from my son. He caused a chase, and during that time, my son died. And now I live in constant fear, afraid that the scoundrel will find out about the children. Do you really think you might want to harm them? Serafina said in horror. Yes, how would I know what's on his mind? Mr. Felix sighed. All right, let's leave speculations aside for now and focus on the immediate issues. Let's start by investigating this person's background. Through my connections, I'll find out if he's as terrible as you fear. Mr. Mark wasn't a murderer. He was simply a practical and business-oriented person. He had his vices, like having an affair with a young maid while his wife took their son to various activities and classes. He had work-related troubles and needed to relax without bothering his wife unnecessarily. Who could have known that Elena, the maid, would turn out to be so foolish? He asked about safety, and all she could say was, Everything's fine, I know what I'm doing. And also, I love you. He should have fired her right then, but he didn't have time for that. And what was she hoping for? Unclear. She concealed everything. She should have spoken up immediately. He would have given her the money she needed, and everything would have been fine. Even later, when her pregnancy was revealed, why didn't she demand money and quietly leave? No, she had to create a scandal for the whole world to see. She told everything to his wife. What wisdom was that? As if his wife didn't know everything without her. Well, it's one thing to know something about yourself, but it's another when your own servant shoves it in your face and even shakes her belly while doing it. It's understandable that the wife got angry. He created this mess, so he should untangle it himself. But to think that none of this would ever come out. It's clear that they'll have to find a solution somehow. Where can you hide? He doesn't need any extra rumors, let alone additional heirs. This girl, Elena, gave birth to twins, for heaven's sake. She's gone now, sad, of course. But she was young, attractive, she could have had a good life if she had more sense. But on the other hand, one less problem, two more problems because who knows who she blabbered all this to. At least her parents are as they should be, her father's a drunkard, her mother's a fool. He met them, talked to them. They're clueless about her situation. They don't want the children, they don't even want to see them. He gave them some money, and it's up to them how to deal with it. And as for the children, let the state handle them. But no, this crazy chauffeur had to interfere. What's with that? Once you engage with one lunatic, a dozen others stick around, you can barely fend them off. And you don't know what to expect from whom. This young guy too, well, what was stopping him from living his own life? No, he started, you'll pay for this, your children will pay, I have evidence. Well, who did he prove anything to? He crashed and those children disappeared somewhere. Mr. Mark understood that he needed to find a place for the little ones. Not to kill them, God forbid. He didn't kill anyone, not Elena, not that chauffeur, and certainly not newborns. He wanted to find good people for adoption, separately, of course. It's harder and riskier with both of them. One he intended for a friend, a good man. His wife had issues with forbidden substances before, got cured, but she can't have children. And she wants children, plus they're well off. It would work out perfectly for them. He already found a nice family abroad for the other child. But no, that chauffeur managed to hide them somewhere before he crashed. According to Mark's knowledge, he had adopted them, put them under his name. And it seemed like everything would be settled, the chauffeur's children. 
The mother died too, and Mark has nothing to do with it. But life's like a powder keg anyway. You never know who these lunatics might have blabbered things to. And worse, put it in writing. And they might well have done so. And his wife nags about it. Where are the children? Why can't you resolve everything properly? Are you waiting for them to show up in 20 years with claims? Such a scoundrel you are. But a year went by, and everything was quiet and calm. Yes, how long can one fuss over nonsense? And suddenly, out of the blue, a thunderbolt, a phone call. Mr. Mark, I'm Edgar Green, the manager of such and such bank. We need to talk to you about a personal matter. Mark had no business with that bank. But after the words personal matter, he felt a pang. He didn't even consider fraud. A fraudster wouldn't demand a personal meeting. He had to agree. It's better to somehow resolve this situation than wait for trouble all the time. Mark mentally said goodbye to a portion of his money, hoping that after this meeting, the story would finally end. Edgar turned out to be a pleasant young man with an engagement ring on his finger. That was reassuring. A married man inspires more trust. And he got down to business right away. No introductions, no lyrical digressions, no threats. I know about your children, the twin boys. I know where they are and my wife and I want to adopt them. I assume you wouldn't object? Me? Why would I? But then he remembered that he was a serious, business-minded person and continued in a corresponding tone. The thing is, I'm not sure if they're my children, so what right do I have to give or deny consent to their adoption? I think it makes sense to have a more serious conversation. Proving that the children are indeed yours can be fairly easy. But I believe it's in neither your nor my interest, let alone the children's. Agreed. But then what do you need from me? Both you and I need the assurance that the question of your relationship with these children will never come up again. At that point, the two business persons shook hands and left satisfied with each other and the fact that they'd never have to see each other again. As they parted, Mark suddenly, to Edgar's surprise and maybe even his own, asked hesitantly, What did you name them? The boys, I mean. But were there boys? Maybe there weren't any boys at all? Edgar answered seriously. Serafina was waiting for him in the car, and he happily announced after getting behind the wheel. Well, Serafina, we can confidently start the process of adopting our David and Arthur. You know, I'm really worried about Mr. Felix's health. We need to arrange for him to be examined and treated in a clinic. I hope you don't want to abandon him, taking the children away. Right now, they're the ones giving him the strength to live. Well, what are you talking about? Treatment will start as soon as we find out how necessary he is for the adoption process. We can't keep pulling him out of the clinic every time. And what's with the tears in our eyes? He asked in surprise, seeing his wife's suddenly saddened face. I'm sorry, dear, Serafina kissed her husband. Edgar truly didn't think about the financial costs, and they were quite substantial, even for adopting twins with some confusion in their documents. But money wasn't an issue, including for Mr. Felix's treatment. Fortunately, the examination showed that his illness, although requiring treatment and possibly surgery, wasn't as dangerous as initially thought. He was relieved about that. However, he was even more pleased that his named grandchildren had found a real family and would now grow up in comfort with loving parents. And with their grandpa. Isn't that right, Mr. Felix? You'll agree to move into our house after you're discharged, won't you? Serafina said, thinking he'd be pleased. But the man unexpectedly hesitated. That's, of course, nice. Even tempting, I would say. But the young ones should live separately, right? 
Besides, I'm used to my own den. I have a workshop there, all my things. Well, you understand, at my age, it's hard to uproot yourself. What are you saying? Serafina was even frightened. We'll move everything and set up a workshop for you just as good as it was. And the grandkids, they love you so much. Well, what can I say? I love them too. But we'll still be able to see each other, right? Visit back and forth. Well, I'm used to living where I am. I have friends and comrades there. And, to be honest, he admitted with a slight blush, a certain personal life. The neighbor, the one who looked after the kids, something seems to be developing between us. I mean, we want to live together. She'll move in with me, it'll be good for her kids. Yes, and for me too. I hope you won't insist that in addition to the little ones, we'll also have not just a grandpa, but a grandma too. Serafina laughed with relief and hugged Mr. Felix. Congratulations. Well, of course, we won't hinder your happiness, but we won't allow you to forget us either. By the way, we're expecting a baby girl soon, David and Arthur's little sister. She could use another grandma and grandpa as well. Just focus on getting better soon, now that you've decided to start a new life. Soon, in Serafina and Edgar's new home, little Monica arrived. And the family truly became blissfully happy. Even Mrs. Eleanor came to terms with her son's expanded family. To her own surprise, she grew to love both her grandchildren and her granddaughter.